Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on what side of the pod you're on. And welcome to the EFL League One Week One Wrap Up Edition of Across the Pitch. My name is Phil Kennedy, and I'm here with Tony Robinson, where we picked out uh, three games in addition to the Accrington game that we found uh, the results to be a bit interesting in over the weekend. And then we're going to look ahead to the games coming up in week two. Uh, So welcome to the show, Tony, and give us your thoughts on on week one. Uh, You know, what what was kind of your your biggest takeaway from week one? Uh, Hi, Phil. It's nice to be uh, on again with you, of course. And uh, yeah, it's it's quite an exciting weekend. And, and, you know, the, the big takeaway I have is, you know, the teams that are expected to do well, the the ones with the high bar. Uh, the set, you know, it's set really by by the fans mostly. Uh, you know, teams like uh, Portsmouth and uh, and Peterborough failed to, uh, you know, like Peterborough lost to Stanley two nothing, and and uh, Portsmouth were held to a goalless draw with Shrewsbury. Um, yet the fans, uh, if you listen to the fans on uh, social media, uh, you think the sky was falling. And I think <laughs> we have we have to keep in mind that it's only one game and uh, in yeah. the season. You know, it's it's too early. It's too early to start pressing the panic button and 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 calling for the manager's head in Portsmouth. Uh, you know, I think I just think that's a, a, just a little bit over the top at the moment. But uh, as far as off the field, that's what sort of grabbed my attention this weekend. You know, Tony, I think that's spot on, and I think that's kind of the theme of the show here uh, is that there was definitely. Four games where I think these are all four teams that both of us had either at least in the playoffs or getting promoted here this year that either drew or lost to a a club that was expected to maybe be mid-table. And and since we uh, are an Accrington show first and foremost, we're going to start off with the Accrington-Peterborough match. Uh, That's one that I was able to watch on the the iFollow service. Uh, and, and Tony, realistically, I think that it might be a situation where Accrington caught Peterborough at the right time. Because, I, you know, over here in the, the United States, we actually have uh, American football or, or NFL season kicking off today as well. And one of the things that you hear a lot of the announcers say in, in that sport is that early in the season, the defenses are ahead of the offenses. Uh, and that's just because offense takes a little bit more timing than defense, where defense is just kind of more about hard work than, than anything else. So I, I think when you have a, a high-powered team like the Posh, maybe it takes them a, a week or two to, to kind of get rolling. The other thing is you had uh, Smudik who uh, just came in this week. He was with Peterborough last year, uh, but he just re-signed with them this week. So he was kind of not really into sync yet. I, I mean, I'd say their their back line, especially Mark Beavers, he looked in midseason for, but I, I just think their offense maybe will will need a couple of weeks to get into uh, to sync. Now, that's not to say that, that Accrington's defense uh, and Toby Savin didn't do well. I mean, this kid, this was his first league game. He had a five-save clean sheet. I, I mean, it was an impressive all-around performance for Aki. Well, and, and on top of that, I think one of the things I, I found out afterwards is that Darren Ferguson, uh, in his post-match uh, comments, uh, uh, mentioned there was a couple of players that uh, were held back because of being uh, tested positive for coronavirus, uh, and a couple of the the teammates that live with one of the players had to be isolated. Um, you know, so that has that can have an impact not only on the pitch but mentally too in the dressing room. Uh, not to say that uh, that's the reason they lost, but you know, it's one of the factors goes into it when you're stepping on the pitch. And uh, you know, from what I saw and. And and I was going to ask you, Phil, but from what I saw, uh, you know, uh, they certainly allowed Accrington to play, and and uh, and Accrington were getting into a lot of open spaces. 
maybe for, for our fans, you could just tell us a little bit about what you saw as far as the, the lineup and the formation for Macrington. Yeah, I'm glad that you asked about that, Tony, because that's really the, the next thing that I wanted to talk about. In our preview episode, we had talked about how Accrington's kind of three best backline players were all center backs by trade. Well, Accrington ended up coming out in a 3-5-2 formation, which means you have uh, three defenders, five midfielders, and two forwards. And then uh, they came out with Mark Hughes in the middle uh, and then Ross Sykes and Cameron Burgess on either side. So those were your three defenders. All three of those guys are uh, are center backs by trade. Uh, and then so uh, then you also you had at the midfield, you had three kind of deeper or more defensive-minded midfielders where you had Seamus Keneally, uh, Mo Sungari, uh, and then you also had, uh, well, well, we'll hold off on this guy for uh, a minute. Right. Because uh, this guy is the man at the hour. Uh, and then you had Joe Pritchard off on the wing. Uh, and then you also had uh, Matt Butcher. Uh, he was back playing more of the, the defensive role. Uh, and then up front, you had Ryan Cassidy and Dion Charles, who scored one of the best goals that you'll ever see just about 40 yards out he blasted that but the guy i want to talk about is the other winger Tariq Uwakwi. this guy he came out he scored three goals had the hat trick and uh, the assist against leeds united under 20 woods where when aki beat them seven nil uh, in that efl trophy and, and we're like well you know okay it's one thing to do it against a youth team in the EFL trophy. But this guy came out, he got on the board, he had Aki's second goal. Uh, it was another beautiful strike. Uh, he's a guy that, that's really, uh, he, he's a creator, he's strong on defense, uh, he's fast, he, he's a good at, at passing, he's good at crosses, he's got a, an accurate shot. I mean, there really doesn't appear to be anything this guy can't do. So, I, I mean, we're, we're really heavily reliant on loan players. So, I mean, this is kind of a one-year kind of deal. But I really think that, uh, you know, yes, Peterborough may not have been in mid-season form, but John Coleman's got himself side this year. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things you touched on, Phil. And uh, this is something that we talked about, uh, you know, previously, is because of the, way, the makeup of the team, could he go to a different formation? Uh, and it makes sense because he's, you know, you got to play Hughes and Sykes and, and uh, Burgess and the, the overabundance of midfielders uh, that he has. And, and I mean, I think, you know, from, the, from what I saw, you know, I think they all contributed. I mean, uh, uh, was it Butcher that rattled one uh, shot off the post? Uh, uh, and the goal that you said, you mentioned about uh, by Dion Charles. Um, we talked before about, uh, you know, having people on that 18 yard box or uh, for the for the second ball. And, and, you know, when the ball came out to Charles, I mean, as, that's as sweet a strike as you're going to see it. And uh, if that was in the Premier League, that would be played over and over and over again. It was, uh, uh, you know, a really, really super goal and, and nothing to take away from uh, Uwekwe's goal, too, because the way he come in on that loose ball. Uh, and curled it around the keeper into the top corner, uh, you know, shows shows class for a player of that age. So, yeah, it's, um, uh, you, you know, I mean, a good performance overall. And and we've mentioned about Charles, you know, this is a season that, you know, he, he really has to prove himself. And, uh, uh, you know, so far, so good. We also got an opportunity for a bishop to come on for a few minutes. Um, you know, so everything yeah, it was seemed great to see. Uh, see yeah, Colby make his way back. That that was kind of a bit of a surprise because we didn't really know when he was going to be back. Uh, and I do just real quick, I want to give a shout out to uh, Dan Jewell for uh, for mentioning myself and also the show a couple times on the broadcast. Uh, Dan Jewell of BBC Lancashire. Uh, thank you for the uh, the shout outs on the I Follow broadcast. Now, yeah, they, of the uh, the I follow broadcast. We have someone else who has joined the watching Accrington Stanley on I follow team, and he he's popped in here. 
Uh, we're talking about our friend Harry Austin, uh, who you may know from the San Antonio soccer show. Uh, he he roots for that USL team down in uh, southeastern Texas that we won't talk about <laughs> too much. But uh, he's recently joined the Accrington Stanley family. And, uh, and Harry, one of the things that we wanted to talk with you about here uh, was what was your first impression of watching a live League Wood Accrington Stanley game? And, and welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us again tonight. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invite here. Uh, for me, like I said here, I, prior to this year, I'd never watched an Accrington Stanley game you know, in my life. Um, but, you know, listening to, you know, your show for what the last year and a half, at least, um, became kind of a fan where like last year I'd follow them on foot mob and stuff. But, uh, uh, this year I decided to make them my uh, team in England and, you know, cause I hadn't had one and, uh, you know, for the first, first games, you know, with the, you know, starting with the leads, uh, was it U21? Um, and then with the, uh, uh game against Peterborough, like I said here, you know, Outside of not seeing, you know, the fan support, you know, which obviously they can't do right now. Uh, I thought it was a great, you know, two uh, world-class goals that you, know, you guys were just discussing, you know, on there, you know, really at any level, whether it's Premier League, you know, USL or um, League One, you know, those are those were highlight goals. So I'm looking forward to kind of seeing how this year works out for them and, uh you know, like I said here, if, you know, Petersboro, you know, you know, put up a, a good game. And, you know, if you look at the stats, you know, it was, it, it was a pretty even game. And, um, you know, for me, just, you know, being a new fan, you know, for, you know, for, for Stanley here, it's, it's a learning experience. Uh, just, you know, I, I know I ask you tons of questions, Phil, about, you know, the differences and, you know, comparing, you know, League One to USL and, and vice versa. And, uh, so it, it's, you know, like I so here as, as a first time, you know, fan of watching the game, you know, no complaints, obviously the results, you know, went, uh, went the direction that we want, but, uh, um, you know, it's a young season. Well, we're tremendously excited to, to have you watching Stanley here with us this year. And, and we definitely are, are going to have you on the show here periodically to, uh, talk about just what you were saying earlier is kind of comparing a USL championship, which is, uh, I know, what you're most familiar with watching over here versus League One. And, and last year, you may remember where we did the uh, kind of Phoenix Rising versus uh, Accrington Stanley uh, imaginary match. And, and that was a lot of fun. And, and you know, I, I've kind of been of the opinion that the, the defenders are better in England where the the top offensive players, the top wingers, top strikers over here at the USL could probably do well for themselves in League One. I'm not quite sure if the defensive players over here are kind of up to that standard. Tony, would that be your observation from what you've seen? Yeah, I think so, Phil. I, and, and also, I think you've got to, uh, you know, look at in League One, the, the level of, of the defenders uh, is that much uh, better than in League Two, and and that's something that when we've talked to players uh, who commented, uh, some of the tough uh, adjustment is is coming up against uh, top defenders, and uh, you know I think um, you know based on what what we we've, we've talked about, you know going to a new formation this year is is uh, you know is playing to the strengths of the squad as we've said, uh, but it also you know it shows the caliber of players. Uh, that uh, that Stanley has, and you know, I mean, when you got Ross Sykes, uh, you know, uh, at, still at a young age, excelling at the, at this level, you know, it shows that that the quality of, of, of players you, you you needed on the defender on defense at, to, in League One because uh, you know you're going to have to. It's a long season, and and you're going to have to uh, put up some clean sheets if you certainly want to move up the table. Yeah, I think that you're definitely going to see more clean sheets more 2-1 games and less 5-1 games on that on that side of the pond. And the, the, the thing that I think that it comes down to more than anything, and this is something that, that Tony and I uh, have talked about a lot, is that there's really no consequence for losing over here, if you will, because, I mean, uh, the, the team that finishes last place of the USL Championship is still going to be playing in the same tier 
in the same league as the team that finishes first place, where these teams over in England, they're there's a consequence for losing because you know you're you're out of the league if you finish in the bottom four, especially in League One because you're relegating four teams from that league. Uh, and Harry, I think that one of the things that you would be familiar with, and uh, one of the easier ways to explain it, is in the uh, the NCAA college basketball tournament when you have the the teams from the big conferences like the ACC, the Pac-10 that have the best athletes, they have one way of playing. And then you have these teams that will come into the uh, NCAA tournament, uh, which is something like the Ivy League or, you know, just some small school that that doesn't really concentrate on athletics. And Mm -hmm. they, they come in and they play against these big teams and they cause them problems because of the way they play, just because it's very disciplined and technique oriented. Uh, And I I think that in League One, you're going to see a lot more teams playing that way, where at USL, uh, you're going to have a lot more teams that that even the less talented teams are going to kind of play more of the the wide open style because there's not as much of a consequence for losing. Well, we even see that here in the USL between the East and the West. Um, The West is a lot more open. Um, where the East, uh, I think, is a little bit more traditional, a little bit more, you know, old schoolish or more English, or, you know, if that's how you want to say it, um, where it's more defensive or- oriented. I know Phoenix and, and San Antonio, you know, play the more open game, uh, but to me, you can see you can see the you know a lot of the talent um, over there. I, I think one of the interesting things, um, you know, and this might be for you know for a future discussion is, you know, if we're having this discussion five years from now, USL is, what, 10 years, or this version of USL is, what, 10 years old, um, where League One, you know, you know, you know, it's already established. It's got, you know, all the historical roots and stuff, you know, that, that's developed in it. And so, to me, I'm looking forward, because if you go back to USL two years, three years ago, you're probably looking more probably League Two mm. um, at best. Um, where now you can see kind of the talent that's coming in, you know, from, you know, I know in San Antonio, we've, we brought in quite a few Argentinians. Um, you know, I know Jamaica, you know, and, um, you know, with rising, you know, has, has quite a bit of talent from the Caribbean. Um, and then, you know, of course, uh, Barnby, but to me, that's as far as like the comparing of the two sides here, I'd be interested to see how things kind of you know, turn out two, three, four years. Cause, uh, I think, you know, for USL in, in, in soccer in general in the United States, it, it still has the ability to go up where I think in England, you know, it's the best in the world. So uh, obviously the talent's already there and, and it's a proven, uh, proven uh, product. Yeah, you make a great point because the, the talent in the USL championship, even compared to, to two years ago, is noticeably better now, and I think that's something where, where you will see that continue to grow. But this is our uh, League One Roundup show, so we definitely want to move forward on our League One games. Uh, and Tony, one of the ones that you had mentioned kind of in, in the opener here that we can start off with is Shrewsbury versus Portsmouth. Now, uh, uh, that one is one I had my eye on because I first I wanted to see if, if Caleb Johnson played. Uh, not only did he play, he did get the start at right back, played the full 90 minutes, uh, hit four crosses into the box like uh, we expected him to. That's a game where nobody got onto the board. And to me, one of the things is, you know, Peterborough, they went and lost to Accrington at home. Portsmouth, they did only draw. They didn't lose. But this was at Fretton Park. So, I mean, anytime you're, you're dropping points at home, that's a concern, especially to a team like Shrewsbury, where, I, I mean, Accrington, we talked about how they've made eight signings. They brought in some exciting players. Shrewsbury really hasn't brought in much of anybody. Uh, everybody kind of thought that they got worse from last season. Now, it, uh, it sounded like to me you thought this was a don't press the panic button situation. You're still on the uh, the Kitty Jacket train. 
I mean, do you, do you think this was just a blip in the road for Portsmouth or a genuine reason to be concerned? No, I don't. I don't think it's. I mean, it's one match, and, and I mean, they uh, the possession was, you know, uh, in favor of uh, Portsmouth slightly. They certainly had uh, more uh, chances, uh, fourteen uh, shots and six on target to uh, uh, seven and one for Shrewsbury. So, uh, you know, I think it's too. Uh, it's they were, you know, they were the better team, and they will be up there challenging. Uh, but if you listen to Pompey fans, they, you know, uh, for sure they they think uh, they, they're calling for Kenny Jackett's head right now. Uh, and I mean, that's you've got to get behind your team and your manager. And I know that he's not well liked in some circles down there. But, you know, they're if you you've got to look at it, they're they're still undefeated. They they drew at home, which is not what they wanted. Uh, but it's not the end of the world. And, and uh, you know, they will be in it, uh, you know, uh, towards the end of the season. So I, I'm not uh, I'm not only concerned that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, Portsmouth are in trouble. I think it's, it's too early, as I said, to pass, uh, uh, press the panic button. They will be they will be OK. And, and I still put them in the, uh, you know, uh, in the top two for, for this league. That's what I'm, I'm looking at here is what you brought up earlier. This was kind of a, a keeper that kept his club in the game from what I saw. Now, I'm, I'm probably going to uh, horribly mess this name up. Uh, but Matias Sarkic, he had five saves. Uh, meanwhile, Craig McGilfrey for, uh, for Portsmouth, he only had to make one save. So, I, I mean, this was certainly a situation where Portsmouth had the, the more shots on target uh, like you said, they they did win the possession battle. Uh, had fifty four percent. Their uh, their pack, pass accuracy, uh, shots on target. I, I mean, like you said, just about everything that you can imagine uh, went in favor of the Paul P. Stats wise. So I I think this was maybe you know just one of those ones where where you ran into a hot keeper, uh, and that really brings us into our our next game. Uh, because this was uh, really a situation where, where goalkeepers that have names that are difficult to pronounce had big weeks, <laughs> which was a uh, situation in our Sunderland versus Bristol Rovers. This was another one where a heavily favored team uh, in Sunderland was playing at home. This time it was a 1-1 draw, uh, and it was Ansi Giacola. Uh, who's the the finish keeper for Bristol Rovers, uh, stopping uh, five out of six shots. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Lee Burge for Sunderland, uh, he only faced uh, the, the one shot, uh, had the, the one goal allowed against. That was even a penalty kick that, that he allowed. So, I, I mean, it, it was kind of Bristol. They got the, the goal off the penalty. Sunderland, they got six shots on target, only managed to get one of them in. So this was kind of uh, a game, I, I think. I mean, Sunderland had 72% possessions. So. Well, yeah, it, it was the, the, the field was tilted in, in favor of, uh, of Sunderland. I, I mean, they dominated in all areas. It's just to, they just couldn't get the, uh, the, the ball in the net. But again, it's, uh, I mean, you know, there's, there's just too much panic coming from the Sunderland fans. And, and I, I know Bristol, once they uh, got the goal and, and uh, you know, it was, you know, when after, even after, um, before, well, even before Sunderland scored, but afterwards they they didn't win a lot of fans with their tactics of, of, you know, uh, of, of delaying the game, so to speak, but any team that's, um, you know, that's not favored to win and, and in a situation playing at Sunderland, uh, you know, if you get in position to gain a point, you're going to do what you can to, uh, you know, to to see the game across the line. Uh, Sunderland would do the same thing if it was if the, if the situation were reversed. No, I I think Sunderland, you know, they are good. They're going to be okay as well. It's just that I just don't think uh, um, you know people. I think people. I should say people are being a bit too hard on them because they were expected to win and they didn't. And, uh, you know, the, the sky isn't falling in Sunderland. Uh, I, I, another team that will be there at about at the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, what you have here where with Portsmouth and Sunderland is you have two teams. They were favored. They dropped points at home. 
Both of these were draws, though. Neither club got beaten. Both of them, when you look at the stat sheet, they clearly outplayed their opponent. So I, I don't think that there's really too much to take away from those games. The next game that I want to get to, which is our fourth and final featured match from week one, uh, is a match where uh, the, the result was maybe somewhat surprising, although I do think maybe it tells more about the team that won than the team that lost. That's Lincoln City over Oxford. Uh, now, unlike the other two teams, this one, uh, Oxford was on the road, uh, so Lincoln was at home. Uh, they got the 2 0 victory. And Lincoln City, they were kind of my sleeper team. I kind of liked what Michael Appleton had done. Right. You think that, that maybe this is uh, an indication that, that okay, you know, Lincoln's going to show something this year? Uh, or do you think it's just a matter of, you know, Oxford getting a slow start on the road? I think this result, uh, Phil, is a lot like uh, not only in the scoreline, but I think there's a lot of similarities with this result to the Stanley Peterborough match. Uh, Oxford didn't play at their best, and Lincoln played some really nice football. Uh, they got an early goal uh, in the seventh mini- minute mark. So, you know, that uh, that can give a team a lot of confidence. And, you know, I had Lincoln in the, in the middle of the pack as far as the table is concerned. You know, they're a team uh, that could move up, uh, but I still think Oxford, again, it's a team that's expected to do well, and I, I don't see any reason why after one match, uh, you know, they won't be in the, in the, in the top six or seven teams. Um, it's, it's a, again, a good result for Lincoln because uh, they played well, but I, I wouldn't be uh, too overly concerned that Oxford are, are in trouble. Uh, one thing, the, the fans for Oxford aren't panicking like the other two teams because I think, you know, they uh, they know they have a good team and uh, they just are, like the people have said before, it's a, it's a uh, marathon, not a sprint. And, and they realize that, you know, at the end, Oxford will, uh, will, be, uh, will be challenging. All right. Well, Tony, I, I think that we're pretty much in agreement here. We have four teams that were expected to be good. Uh, I think that the the results, it's a 46-match season in League One. Yeah. You know, you have to take the first week with, with a great assault. I do think that, that Accrington and, and Lincoln certainly have seen enough to be excited about. But now is a good time for us to, to kind of move on to match day two, which is coming up this Saturday. And to me... Uh, there's a couple of games that really jump out because they actually involve three out of the four teams that we had just talked about. Uh, let's start off uh, where we had just ended with, which is Oxford. They actually play Sunderland at home this week. Uh, so what do you expect to see in that one? Which, uh, which team do you think are going to get on track here? Or do you think maybe this is a a draw. When I, I look at this, I'm thinking this could be a draw match. Yeah, I, I'm of the same opinion. I, I think it's a it's a match that you know both teams obviously want to get a result from. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Oxford don't want to go zero uh, and two, uh, and you know they're playing at home. So uh, yet Sunderland, they want to come out and show that uh, you know the, this uh, the result on the weekend that they are a good team and they can get a result. You know, regardless of you know, the possession they had on the weekend, and they want to translate that into a result uh, next week. So, yeah, I think this one, uh, I haven't seen the betting line, but I, I'd have to, I'd be awful surprised if this set didn't have a draw all written all over it. Uh, you know, Sunderland doesn't want to, uh, they want to, they, you know, they certainly don't want to lose this one, and neither does Oxford. So, yeah, I agree with you, Phil. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you. I mean, it, it's going to be an interesting one. Uh, one of the things is that, I think Sunderland has led the league in draws two years in a row. So we yeah, know they, do. That they know how to draw. Uh, I think that, like you said, Oxford, they played a good game the other day. Uh, they're going to be at home. I, I think if somebody wins, it'll be Oxford. But I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go with a draw in this one. So the, the, the other one that really jumped off the, the map to me was Peterborough and Fleetwood, because uh, this is two more teams that I think that we both thought were going to be in the playoffs. Also, a couple of high-powered offenses. Fleetwood did win their opening match, so uh, they were one of the teams that took care of business week one against Burton at home. 
Now they're going on the road. They're playing at Peterborough. Tony, what, what do you see happening in this one? This, this is my match of the week, I think. You know, the, the other one, Oxford and Sunderland, that's going to be a great game. But I, I'm a guy that likes to see scoring, and I think we're going to see more scoring in this one. Yeah, I think uh, I see this one as a, a possibly a 3-2 uh, for Peterborough. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be some goals in it because of the uh, uh, the way Fleetwood plays. And uh, I think or, I think Peterborough are going to come out, uh, uh, you know, firing on the weekend uh, to make amends for dropping points to Stanley. So I see this one as a, a you know, 3-2, 4-3, but there's going to be goals, but I give the edge to Peterborough. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if the same Peterborough team shows up on Saturday that showed up against Stanley, they're probably not going to win. At home, I, I think that they will get things together. Fleetwood, they could be really good this year. I, Callum Camps, who I talked about a lot on the uh, yeah. preview show, he actually scored a goal here opening week, so he seems to have kind of fit right in there. I'm going to go ahead and, and call it upset here. I, I think Peterborough, they just kind of looked out of sorts. I, I think that, that Fleetwood, uh, they're going to go in there and, and pull the upset. I'm going to call that. What, now, what's, your, what's your score, uh, Bill? 3-2. Three, three, oh, you're going 3-2 the other way. Okay. 3-2 the other way, yeah. Right, okay. Now, uh, now Tony, you're, you're – uh, Winning the league pick was Portsmouth, and as we talked about earlier, they got off to a, a bit of a, a rocky start here. Even though they're going to be on the route this week, I think that they have the game on the schedule that it'll get anybody on track. Well, yeah, they, and this is a, you know, I, I think a, a definitely, you know, I look at it and I see this as a 2 uh, two nothing win for Portsmouth or a 3-1 win. Uh, you know, I think that... The, not only will they win, they have to win because, uh, uh, you know, if they go down, um, yeah, drop uh, uh, three points or, or just come away with a draw, uh, you know, all heck is going to break loose down in uh, Pompey <laughs> land. But uh, I, I see this as a Portsmouth, Portsmouth win. Now, that game is on Sunday. That's the one and only match yeah. on Sunday. So we'll have to wait an extra day for that one. But I, I'm going to go ahead and say, Anything less than three points in Kenny Jackett's going to get the sacking after that one. Well, it's it's early days to do that, but it certainly you'll be uh, you'll there'll be a lot of fans that'll be agreeing with that uh, your position on that because uh, they want him gone now. And uh, <laughs> uh, so if, if they lose to Rochdale, definitely they uh, uh, you know they'll be out for uh, blood on that one. Yeah, I mean Rochdale, they're just a team that everybody has them going down. It been well documented all of the players yeah. they lost and all the players that they they didn't bring back and you know i understand it's early in the season but jacket is a guy that's been under fire it's a big money team there's high expectations i mean if you go in uh, and you don't meet a team like rochdale then i i think it is time for a new manager at that point well uh, you might be right all right, well, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Accrington Stanley as the last game that we'll preview here for uh, the upcoming week. Uh, we started with our flagship team, and we'll uh, wrap up with our flagship team. Uh, they're playing Burton Albion at Burton for the second time in two weeks. Now, in the uh, the first game was in the uh, Carabao Cup. Uh, we ended up getting the 1-1 draw with Cameron Burgess getting the equalizer late. Uh, and then lost that one in penalties to get uh, eliminated from the tournament. I consider that to be a draw myself just because, you know, once you go to penalties, kind of anything can happen. Yeah. It's also worth noting that uh, Seamus Keneally, uh, he was on the bench. He didn't play in that match. Uh, Colby Bishop wasn't ready yet. Uwakwe wasn't even with the team yet. So this is a little bit different and better side. Plus, I don't know how much Stanley actually cares about winning in the EFL Cup. So I, I think that we're going to see a stronger Stanley side than we did the EFL Cup. Burton is one of those teams that it's kind of on the digression. So uh, I, I've got high hopes. I, I mean, it's going to be a tough uh, 
tough road match, but I, I think it's one that, that we can't get three or at least one point out of. Well, I, I think this is obviously Stanley's uh, going to be, a, it's a different team that they, uh, you know, that uh, Burton's going to see this time uh, next week. Um, you know, so I, I think that's uh, going to be an adjustment for Burton to get, uh, you know, to get their heads around the new formation and, and the new players. I see this one as an Accrington win. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a 2-1 away win. And, and, and this is a, you know, a match that they can, uh, you know, they can build on, you know, they built on the, the, the win against Leeds and, and a terrific win against Peterborough. Uh, you know, the confidence is good. So I expect this to carry over uh, uh, against Burton. And, I, I, you know, I, I hate to say I put Stanley as a favourites because generally in the past, uh, Accrington doesn't seem to like the favourite role a uh, heck of a lot. <laughs> and they always seem to do well as an underdog. Uh, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say this is an away win for Stanley 2-1. Yeah, I haven't looked at the bidding line yet, and I would say that they're somewhat of a favorite, but I, you know, on the road, I think that when the actual line comes out, that Burton still might be the favorite. I, I think the line is really going to tell us a lot about this game. This will be one of those matches where you look at the line, and that's going to kind of tell you what the, the pros think, but uh, confidence is a big word that you mentioned there, Tony, and I definitely think that Accrington has to be just filled with confidence. I mean, that that 7-0 beatdown of Leeds uh, under 21s, I mean, I, I understand that wasn't even a full under 21 side, but anytime you beat someone 7-0, that's going to be a confidence boost. Then you come in opening week, a game that people aren't expecting you to win, you win that one 2-0. Uh, your keeper is looking strong, coming off of back-to-back clean sheets. You're going into a Burton team that, that's got a new manager. Nigel Clough is gone. They've got a Jake Buxton, first-time manager, player manager. Uh, and I think John Coleman will have something up his sleeve for him. I'm going to say 3-1 because I, I think Stanley is going to be a better offensive team than people think this year for, for what I've seen so far. Yeah, and I think I think Burton is one of those teams that you could look at as a measuring stick uh, against Stanley is to see where where you're going to finish in the league because it, it's if you can if you beat Burton then you know that's a, to me a good indicator is that you're you know you're going to finish uh, above them in the in the table. I know it's only one match, but uh, I think they're a measuring stick, and if you prove yourself against them. Uh, you know, uh, I think you're going to get more believers. I think that's one of the things right now is that probably a lot, the betting line might show uh, that they don't have uh, the confidence or the belief in Stanley just yet, may not uh, totally believe in them uh, even after beating Peterborough. But I think we uh, we know uh, with the with the way they they played on Saturday, that with the confidence of the way they, they have it now is, uh, you know, they go in and they get the first goal. I think they're going to be... Uh, they're going to be hard, uh, hard pressed to be beaten, and uh, you know I, I'd love, I, hey, I'd love a three-one win, uh, but Stanley never do anything easy, so I'm, I'll, I think I'll stick with the two-one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that as much as we talked about the fact that maybe Peterborough didn't bring their A game, and you know maybe some players weren't completely worked into the squad yet. Conversely, the way that Stanley played on Saturday, if they play that way. They could beat anybody. I, I mean, they're they're just they. It, it was a complete performance. Uh, they they created their chances. They picked their spots, and I think those three center backs, Hughes, Sykes, and Burgess, play that three man back line. Uh, they, they're allowing. They they it just gives you enough strength to be able to play those five midfielders. Then you got those guys uh, that are able to get the ball up to the two forwards. I I think that that things are. Are looking up, uh, Harry. What's your uh, your thought? I know that you watched the game last week, so uh, give us a prediction for Stanley on the the Burton match. Yeah, I'm going to go with the two one for Stanley as well. Uh, just kind of going through the the history of uh, League One, it seems like uh, to avoid going down, if you can get above fifty points, you know, you should be relatively safe. And um, if they can get the win, you know, against uh, Burton. And then with the home match uh, next week, that you know it could set them up in, in a pretty good position for the first three games. Just kind of looking at the lines here, I do think that Burton is a, is a slight favorite uh, on here, but two uh, one. Um, 
you know, with the, with the young kid from the Loney from uh, Chelsea, like I said, obviously I'm a huge fan of his and, and his performance, you know, that last week here. So um, I bet you he gets another one and, and, you know, they, they come home with the, with the three points. Well, I, I think that you're uh, right on track and it, it sounds like, uh, like Tony is, is in agreement too. I, I think that Tony, uh, it sounds like all of us are, are in about an agreement here. What, what are your parting thoughts on uh, on Stanley match, Tony? Well, I think we've you know we've uh, you know we've covered you know the the new formation and and the way they're playing and they just seem to be moving the ball well, getting into open spaces, uh, you know, getting the second ball, uh, utilizing you know their their strength in uh, defense to, with the center backs and and getting them into the box for set play. So. Uh, you know, uh, it's um, it's a funny old game, but uh, confidence, uh, you know, is a big thing when you step on that pitch at three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, yeah, uh, let's hope we're all we're all, re- all correct, and we they we come away with a, a win. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Tony, uh, we ran through three uh, three matches here plus the Stanley match. Were there uh, any other matches on the schedule Saturday that, that caught your eye that, that you wanted to give a mention to before we wrapped up? Yeah, just the, the one match which was actually played today, which was the uh, Ipswich and uh, Wigan match. And, you know, I think uh, Wigan had, they lost 19 players. They got one player, I think, on the starting lineup today that was from their team that got relegated. Uh, and I'll tell you, they played well. They give uh, uh, they give it which uh, uh, you know a run. So I think it, I think Wigan will uh, will be a, a, will be okay. They've just brought in a new manager, Paul Sheridan from over in Ireland. You know he's going to take some time to get adjusting to the squad. I think uh, hopefully Liam Richardson will stick around uh, to help him. They've got two ex Stanley ex Stanley players that played well in uh, in Naismith and Roberts. So I thought they I thought they played well under the circumstances, but also I think Ipswich is a strong team, and I uh, I see them uh, again uh, being at the uh, being at the top. So I I think uh, look for Wigan to pick up their first three points next uh, week at home. All right. Well, I think that that gives us a uh, a good outlook on week one and uh, kind of a, a nice look at what some of the bigger teams have done. Uh, Harry, did she have any burning questions for us before we wrap up? Because I, one of the things that, that we're going to bring you on here for is, uh, you know, we we've got a lot of new fans, not just in the U.S. but around the world, who are watching Accrington Stanley or or League Wood for the first time this year. So, uh, what's your your other biggest burning question that you have after watching your first week of, of League Wood? So, I guess here's. And it's not even an on-field question, but obviously stateside here, we drive to the games and tailgate and, and stuff like that. You know, I was, you know, goofing around on, on the uh, Stanley website and, and just looking at the parking spot where they mentioned that they had 54 slots, you know, available and the pricing along those lines here. So to me, I think kind of the unique thing that, the big difference that I see, you know, between stateside and over in England is how people get to the games and how it's really more of a community, you know, you know environment over there as far as, you know, how people get to the games. Cause I'm assuming it's mostly people locally in the area or they take public transportation compared to here stateside. So, and I guess this would be a question for you, Phil. Could uh, it'd you- probably be more for Tony because Tony's, Tony's been, I, I haven't uh, been to to Accrington, so so this would be a question for Tony. Well, the, the question for you is: Could you imagine a team stateside only having fifty four parking slots? Do you think that would be able to be worked? <laughs> well, well, it would work in Orange County because that's how many fans. <laughs> well, it's it's funny you say that because the stadium uh, where it is, it was sort of. Uh, Everything is built around. It's built in an area. It's, it's behind a pub, and it's down the side street from houses and, and subdivision. And so you're just uh, you you just have the space that you're given to do what you can for parking. But they set up tents, uh, you know, for and they usually have a band playing before the match, and and then they have the fan zone for away uh, supporters and and home fans, uh, which is you know where people gather and you know the club sells the beer and the uh, beer and pie, pie, pie uh, and, uh, you know, they gather, they gather that way. But there is a lot of people that will they park on the streets or 
or they do uh, you know walk to the walk to the match. But uh, it's a it's a funny setup because you know where when you look at uh, stadia in North America generally you know you have the stadium in the middle and surrounded by parking spots. Well, uh, that's that's exactly the opposite when you get a, a, a ground uh, basically not in the middle of town, but sort of set in a residential area, it, it sort of limits what you can do with uh, for parking. Well, that's an excellent answer and, and much more than I could have told. Uh, Harry, if you don't know, uh, Tony actually, uh, he's originally from Accrington and grew mm-hmm. up on Stanley Street, which is the street that the team is named after. He lives in Toronto now, which is where you get the boots from. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, Phil. A, or should I say A, Phil? (laughs) Well, it's been a great time with you guys here tonight, and we're going to try to to record one of these every Sunday uh, and then have that out by Monday. Uh, Weeks that there are Tuesday and Saturday games, we're going to do our best to kind of cover both the upcoming Tuesday and Saturday matchups. uh, and then, you know, just kind of help this for uh, for you guys to catch up on uh, every Monday. Uh, and Tony, Harry, thank you for uh, for joining me. Uh, and uh, I think you guys know how we like to finish up on Stanley on. On Stanley on, Phil. On Stanley on.